to start to talk a little bit with Cable Green. Um, Cable is, he is the Director of Global Learning at Creative Commons. Um, and we're very lucky to have him today. So he's been doing a bunch of work on open licensing, open education resources, open policies, with the goal of really improving access to high quality education and learning for as many people as possible. Um, and has a bunch of experience in academic tech and online learning. Um, so uh, he's with us today, um, and um, you'll hear from him now. And then you can follow him on Twitter after at, at cgreen. So I have a few questions uh, that I'm just going to ask Cable and kind of let him talk a little bit about his view on things. Um, and hopefully, again, this is going to give um, a nice, some nice context around the importance of this kind of ecosystem level thinking, open standards, and openness in general. So welcome, Cable. Um, the first question is really around the word open. So what does the word open mean to you, and kind of what do you see as the value of openness in learning? And thanks, Erin, and, and Jarl, and everyone else for uh, the invitation. It's a real honor to be asked to join this MOOC. Uh, it's an impressive uh, list of curriculum that you're all working through, and I think really important topics. So uh, thanks again. So, so what does open mean to me, and, and kind of what's the value of openness in learning? I, I think uh, uh, Aaron hit some really important points that there's a difference between free and open. So when we're talking about open at Creative Commons, when we're talking about open in open educational resources, in open data, uh, free and open source software, open access journals, uh, et cetera, we're really talking about open having two major characteristics. One is that you have free access to the work or the software or the research article or the textbook or whatever it might be. So it's gratis. You can get access to it at zero cost. Uh, but that's not enough. Free is not enough. You must also have the legal rights to make changes to that thing. It could be the software or a textbook or replace chapter two or whatever. And that those legal rights to make changes, <coughs> that's typically where Creative Commons licenses uh, come into play. Uh, so for something to be open, it's got to be both free and you've got to be able to legally uh, change it. So we're seeing a rub uh, with this, uh, for example, with, with MOOCs. Uh, uh, not your MOOC so much because yours has a, a CC BY NCSA license on it, which is great. Uh, congratulations, although there is a, a flaw that I, will, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out. So if you look at, so Jarl, this one's for you, my friend. So if you look at the home page there of your course, what you'll see is it says, and I quote, no open educational resources have been shared at this time. Uh, but that should be an easy fix because inside the MOOC, I logged in, you've actually got it marked properly with a Creative Commons license. And you also have this nice uh, link here that says, here's the download course package for Blackboard and the common course uh, package. So uh, that's an easy fix. You'll want to take all that good information and get it out on the home page. Um, so I, I tell that little story mostly because being explicit about uh, license and about the capabilities and freedoms and permissions that you give others is sometimes an overlooked point when you're talking about open, be it with software or textbooks or whatever. And if we're not explicit as creators, as authors, then the rest of the world will assume that it's all rights reserved copyright. And in many cases, they won't use it. And of course, that was not our intent. If we uh, intended to share, we, wanted, we just want to be clear about that. So uh, one of the challenges, of course, not with your MOOC, but with some other uh, large and well-known MOOCs is that their content in many cases is free but you don't have the legal rights to revise and remix and redistribute the content. And if you did those things, you'd actually get sued and, and would lose. And so we call that not open or closed uh, being another common term. So you know, when we're talking about open education in particular, let me just drop a, a commonly used uh, definition in the chat window there. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from the Hewlett OER definition. You'll see that it's got those two characteristics. You must have free access, and you must also have the legal rights to make changes. And so when we're talking about open, to get even more specific, uh, we do, you know, we talk about uh, these, these key points. I'll drop this stuff in the chat window as I go. 
In OER, we refer to it as the four R's. You must be able to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute something. So those are the, the sets of legal permissions that we're looking for before we'll call something an open educational resource. In addition to that, we want to make sure that there's no technological obstacles. Uh, so it's, you know, we don't want to put out a textbook, for example, only in a locked down PDF format. It's not editable because while it might, while it may have an open license on it and give people the, the legal permissions to make changes and updates, if you can't do that technically, that's a problem. And then, of course, we want to make sure that the resources we provide are accessible to everyone. We want to make sure that someone who might uh, have trouble seeing or trouble hearing or trouble with contrast can still uh, can still access and not only use but repurpose and revise those materials. And so the kind of the second part of the question, what's the value uh, to learning? Um, you know, Aaron hit a lot of the, the key points, but the value to learning should be fairly obvious, although uh, sometimes we get so stuck in our existing systems and ways of thinking that it's worth being uh, explicit about the obviousness of the, of the proposition that we're being faced with, and that is that it's really for the first time in human history uh, we have the opportunity to share the world's knowledge at the marginal cost of zero. And, and why is that? Well, because digital things have different affordances than things that are made out of atoms. And di mainly, digital things can be stored, replicated, and distributed for almost zero. Now, it's not quite zero, but when you look at cloud computing and the falling costs of devices and the falling costs of, of network plans uh, to get access to the internet, uh, the distributed cost gets very, very close to zero when you get into large numbers. So, of course, as educators, the question to all of us for the last decade has been, if we've got the technological tools, if we've got the, the legal tools like Creative Commons, if we have uh, tools like the Open Badge infrastructure from Mozilla to, to be clear about what people are uh, learning so they can be credentialed in new ways and get the jobs and the degrees and certificates that they, they want in their life to have a better life for themselves and their families, shouldn't we take advantage of those tools? And so really what we're talking about here is everyone uh, who's got access to these digital resources uh, being able to take uh, to participate in learning or to quote unquote get an education. Um, moreover, this is an opportunity for learners to connect to not just knowledge but people around the world, others who are learning what they're learning. So we see uh, very interesting experiments out there like peer-to-peer -peer university and the School of Open and other uh, initiatives. And I know Jane's online. Jane, maybe you can put in some links for, for P2PU and the School of Open. But these are opportunities for people to come together in large numbers, just like this MOOC, uh, to have a learning experience that just wasn't possible before we had the internet and we had digital content. And then, of course, uh, really pushing the ideas of pedagogy. This is an opportunity for learners to co-create their learning spaces and have the legal rights to revise, remix, to update their learning resources. So when I think about the kinds of assignments that I got when I was in high school or college or when I, even when I was doing my doctorate degree at Ohio State, for the most part, they were boring, unauthentic assignments that I knew that I was going to do something, I was going to turn it into one person, the instructor or the faculty member, it was going to be graded and then for all intents and purposes it was going to get thrown in the garbage. And that was an uninspiring learning environment. No matter how interesting the topic, I knew that what I was putting my blood, sweat and tears into just didn't matter because it wasn't going to live on. And when you start to think about openness uh, in terms of the ability to redistribute <coughs> knowledge, in terms of the ability to uh, have the legal rights to make something better, we can think about more authentic, meaningful assignments, assessments uh, that, uh, that people could do. Like imagine walking into a, a class, a physics 101 class, and your professor says, uh, Cable, your job is to make chapter two better so that future cohorts of students that work on, the, that use this open textbook for physics 101 have a better book. Right, all of a sudden, that means something because my actions in the world affect future generations. Uh, or if someone says to me, Cable, your job is to ch help change the curriculum so it better aligns with jobs in your field because the field that you're in, law or whatever it might be, 
has changed so radically in the past five years that the half-life of our curriculum continues to drop. And so we need you to help update it. That's meaningful. That's something I can put on a resume. I want, a, I want an open badge for that that I can put on my, uh, on my blog, on my digital resume to show people that I actually did something that was useful, not just for me to get a grade, but for me to contribute not only to uh, an educational institution, help others, but also to my field at large. Exactly. And then you can, you can brainstorm from there thinking about creating custom courses. So I'll stop yeah, there. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I think um, you brought up a good point that I hadn't mentioned before either, which is um, certainly in the story you just told, um, you know, the learners, uh, when you complete that assessment, like being able to get some kind of representation of, of sort of what you know at that moment or what you achieved is one piece of it. But, but then also thinking about um, recognizing the work of various teachers or contributors as well um, in this kind of bigger ecosystem is a, is a big need and big opportunity. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the importance of open standards and kind of your view on the importance of the, specifically the open badge standard in, in these efforts? Sure. Uh, I'd be happy to. And maybe we can come back to sort of barriers to that a little bit later. But let me jump ahead to, to yeah, open standards. So, you know, open standards, whether they're for electrical sockets in the wall or for, uh, you know, standards on the web that uh, that uh, internet standards bodies come up with these uh, these or the open badge infrastructure from Mozilla. These standards are critical because they're the foundational frameworks uh, and in many ways commodity frameworks upon which creativity can be built, but not without those standards in place. So you think about I you know I use electrical plugs in the wall. If, if all electrical plugs were were different. Uh, no one could build a coffee maker. It'd be too expensive to have different plugs for everything. And as a consumer, I don't really care about the standards uh, for electrical systems. What I want is a cup of coffee, and I want it to be uh, easy to do, and I want it to be as cheap as possible. Uh, and so, not the coffee, the, uh, <laughs> the coffee maker. <laughs> I, I live near Seattle, so I like good coffee. Uh, so, you know, this is really the same thing as far as learners are concerned. The same thing goes uh, for badge infrastructure. Uh, I think Mozilla is an interesting player in this because Mozilla is really a trusted steward of open badges, not only because they launched the, the standard and have been really providing excellent support and, uh, and, and knowledge and information and kind of advertising and professional development around it. Uh, but, you know, again, learners really don't care who does open badges, although most learners uh, would prefer a nonprofit steward like Mozilla because most educational institutions are nonprofit and publicly funded. So there's a, you know, if, if there was a commercial entity that was trying to be the badge infrastructure, there would be a suspicion there, and I think rightfully so. Um, but mostly learners want it to be done well because, again, like I just want to make a cup of coffee, what learners want is, uh, look, give me stackable badges, M make it easy for me to uh, get what I need so that I can get a job or so that I can translate those badges into a certificate or degree. Uh, make it uh, answer all the hard questions for me about who's backing the badge, who's issuing the badge, is the badge secure so that I don't have to defend this new uh, quote unquote accreditation system or ways of displaying what my skills and competencies are, I'd prefer that an external entity, a trusted steward would manage that for me. And so I think that uh, you know, the idea of badges is obviously new. It's a hot topic right now. Uh, you can see in the growth from Aaron's stats just how much it's grown just in the past uh, year. It's amazing. Uh, and I think we'll continue to see that growth. Great. Um, and then I guess, yeah, mention, what you sort of mentioned before is, um, you know, what, what do you see as the sort of core or primary kind of risks or consequences if we sort of aren't using shared standards or aren't focusing on um, sort of openness in, in sort of the badges work in, in the broader landscape? Yeah, so it's really interesting. That, so there are both risks to openness and there are risks of not being open. So. Uh, risk, so before I go into the risks of openness, so let me, let me back in a little bit through talking about what the barriers are to sort of this big crazy dream that we've got of uh, OER and using badging and people being able to get access to, uh, to information that they need. Um, 
you know, why does why isn't this already happening? Why don't all educational institutions use Mozilla badges today? So let me start there, and then I'll, I'll back into your question. Um, so I think that you know it's it's fairly obvious. There's a lot of inertia to existing systems, models, and associated financial models, um, and that business models in particular that were built in a time of information scarcity because that was the environment we lived in. And of course, we don't live in information scarcity anymore. We live in an information abundance. Uh, but those models uh, are that are built on and charge for gatekeeping access to information. Could be journal articles, could be textbooks, could be curriculum, could be accreditation, could be <laughs> right all sorts of things. Those models are uh, going to fight. They are fighting. They're spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt because they want to uh, sustain the existing models that they have. They're institutions. That's what they're that's what they're uh, keyed up to do. Apologies. Let me turn off my phone there. And so, um, so we have to overcome that, and we have to overcome that with uh, with explanations, education, like what Erin uh, and her colleagues do about open badges, like what Creative Commons does with open educational resources. Uh, let me give you just one example to make my point. I live in Washington State. Uh, I've got two kids in the K-12 public education system, kindergarten and third grade. Uh, in my state, there's about one million kids. Uh, we're a small population state, big, big land mass, but small population. Got a million kids in public K-12 in this state. We spend $130 million a year on textbook costs. Uh, so you would think that we'd get uh, a lot of money, or I'm sorry, a really good product. We'd have excellent textbooks. They'd all be digital. Every kid would have devices. We'd have print-on-demand books. They'd be up to date. Uh, uh, we got lots of resources around the books for teachers, for students. Uh, you would think so for $130 million a year, and we spend that every single year. Uh, actually, we don't. What we have are books that are on average 10 years out of date. They're paper only. The kids are told that if they lose the books, their parents have to replace them. So my kids are afraid to take their books back and forth to school because they're afraid they're going to lose the book, and I'm going to have to pay $150 to replace it. Uh, at the end of the school year, we take the learning resources away from the students. We say, uh, thanks for being in second grade. Now give everything back that you used to learn, because clearly you'll never need access to this information again, uh, or in third grade where you're going. I mean, it's a really stupid, stupid system when you think about it. And yet we do it, in, not just in my state, but most states, year after year after year. Is there a better model? Of course there is, right? A better model would be to issue uh, 100 RFPs for textbooks and all the resources we need, put a CC BY license on everything, and pay 20%, you know, pay $20 million a year to keep all the stuff updated, and take the other $110 million a year and hire more teachers and teachers and implement badges in high school so that people could uh, could get uh, the credentials uh, as they accomplish skills so that uh, every kid could have a digital device, every kid could have network connectivity, right? With $130 million, you bet we could do all that. Uh, and, and yet we don't because there is institutional inertia. So um, actually, the, <laughs> my cell phone is uh, good timing because there is a way to change this. Uh, and in fact, the person calling me right now is doing that in, in California as we speak. So what we're working on at Creative Commons is really shifting the money uh, to open. So we call this uh, open policy. And uh, Aaron's part of this uh, fun movement, so I'll drop a few notes in the chat here. Open policy really means that you shift the money at the point of giving the money to require openness. So in the case of Washington State, what I've talked to the legislature about is, look, stop giving the districts $130 million a year. Actually, the districts spend 65, states spend 65, but stop giving them that much money. Instead, give them the money on the condition that they're adopting open educational resources or they're producing OER. The US Department of Labor put out $2 billion for community colleges and said, here, go build next generation curriculum, but everything must have a CC BY license on it if you take this money. Ca uh, California community colleges today, let me drop the link in here, are taking a vote. And if you look at uh, point number 2.1 in that agenda, uh, which here's the direct link to it, it basically is calling for a CC BY or a Creative Commons attribution license requirement on all of the grants that come out of the community college system. So you simply take the choice of being open away at the point of funding, and you say, if you want this money, you'll share what you build. It takes a lot of the barriers out of the way. So now let me answer your question, Aaron, um, about the risks of 
you know, being open. So th one of the risks of being open is that you're challenging all those existing systems. And they will fight, and they're going to be nasty, uh, and they'll do everything they can to maintain their existing models. Um, and so uh, that, that's a challenge. You're going to have to propose new business models. You're going to have to think about funding flows in new ways. And you have to be ready for that fight. Um, increased transparency is also scary to systems. It's scary to people that were previously operating in closed environments. And so if I'm a faculty member and I've taught a certain way for 30 years, I'm nervous about sharing and being open because I don't know if my stuff's out of date. What if someone critiques it? I've never been critiqued before. I've been able to stand up and lecture uh, to my class. And so that's, that's scary and that's something that faculty need support and teachers need support to overcome. Uh, and then, you know, another one is that sharing at the marginal cost of zero presents obvious cost efficiencies to systems. And that can be a clash with financial models that want to sustain big budgets. It's also a clash sometimes with academic freedom. Uh, so, you know, faculty are worried that in, in higher education especially, that if something costs zero, and i.e. open educational resources, uh, that they're, they'll be forced to use something. Yep. And so typically we try to stay away from that. That's great. I mean, I think those those three points are, are, are more um, are kind of perfect um, set up for a lot of the conversations that we're going to be having and trying to dig into with um, with the participants on this course um, and sort of how we think about badges for, for and openness for um, various industries and um, uh, and career pathways. So so thank you. I'm, so um, thanks very much to Cable for joining us.